All right. I want to welcome everybody back to another episode of AML Detectives. We have an amazing guest on, on hand today, Calvin Krusty. Calvin, how are you? Very well. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. And as always, you know, I want everybody to learn a little bit about you, your background, skills, knowledge, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to turn the floor to you real quick. Well, I'll, I'll give you my background. I'm not too sure about my skills, but my <laughs> my background is uh, I did 33 years uh, with the uh, federal police here in uh, Canada. Uh, the majority of the time in international operations, um, a significant amount uh, in the last uh, 10, 12, 13 uh, years mm -hmm. in the world of uh, transnational organized crime. Uh, operating out of uh, Vancouver, but working uh, extremely intimately with um, our U.S. and uh, Five Eyes uh, partners in terms of, uh, you know, cartels, uh, Chinese-based uh, networks and Iranian-based networks, uh, many involved in the money laundering activities. And then I pivoted uh, about four years ago and went into the private sector, uh, working with the critical risk team, which is a alliance of international uh, risk and security entities uh, positioned throughout the globe, uh, dealing with uh, uh, law firms and uh, corporations relative to uh, what I would define as acute risks and uh, threats, inclusive of illicit finance, money laundering, but also foreign influence, um, uh, espionage, uh, other uh, threats, you know, uh, from these transnational networks. Pretty interesting, I have to say. I can't wait to dive a little deeper into that background. Um, so, all right. So, first question with AML regulations changing in recent years, you know, there's been a lot of them, but, you know, when financial institutions look at the new set or the recent legislation, what do you think they should pay attention to the most? I know that's a very broad question, but please narrow it down if you want. Well, I, I know we kind of had a dialogue uh, coming into this uh, in the last week in terms of the regulations issues. And I, and I uh, alluded that um, depending where you are, and I'm obviously based in Canada, you're based in the U.S. and many of your uh, followers are. Um, so I'm a little hesitant to get into the nuances of it because I'm not overly familiar with some of the regulation uh, issues. But what I would say that people pay attention to uh, right now is obviously compliance uh, on them, but also taking it one step beyond the compliance in terms of the tick box. Right. Um, and, and that's essentially to be, I, I think as we'll get into this discussion probably, I hope, um, the, the, the risk of being detected for non-compliance uh, from the global community, I think their efforts in this space are getting more intense mm -hmm. uh, because of some of the environmental um, contexts that um, this activity is taking place in. Um, and that's essentially, uh, you know, some of the stuff relative to Russia, some of the stuff relative to China, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, everybody looks at the one tick box, uh, type mentality in terms of, uh, compliance, in terms of regulations and legal requirements. Um, but I would suggest that a more principle based, uh, and taking that one extra step is something that I would highly recommend. Yeah. And the tick the box doesn't fly with me either. Yeah. Um, it's great, to, great to uh, satisfy the bare bones or the bare basics, but come on, you gotta, we gotta do better than that. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I think I've seen corporations do that. Um, but if you mix the one, one tick, uh, the consequences these days are a lot more, uh, severe than they were say 10 years ago. Yeah. I can almost visualize it now. I mean, granted I was in corporate for a long time. You got a sheet of paper with little boxes, check, check. That's it. We're done. Let's move on and go yeah. to lunch. Yeah not my mentality. All right, so I wanna switch gears a little bit to risk management, all right? So what, what changes have you seen in risk management lately that impacts AML professionals? Well, there's a couple uh, de developments. Uh, I, I would say 
is number one, I, th I think as I alluded in the previous uh, comment, the, the, the whole focus um, or, or the whole context and the environments changed significantly in terms of risk management. And I've been at a couple forums talking about this in the last six months, including at the at a Fortune 100 uh, company uh, forum, and we were talking about another uh, type of threat activity. But the, that geopolitical um, uh, context has changed uh, through um, the, the, the conflict between you know, Western democracies, the five eyes with uh, China, Russia, Iran, um, mm -hmm. and the threat actors are using, you know, these vectors such as uh, money laundering to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, leverage their interests and activities and to support mm -hmm. them. Uh, and that's, you know, probably in the context we don't realize, or a lot of people I don't think realize, uh, because I'm involved in another uh, project on it and talking to law firms and businesses about it. And that's that we're really uh, in a war type situation. And I use the term hybrid warfare situation um, where a lot of these activities are part of the weaponization of various uh, states. And subsequently to it, in terms of risk, that means our own states are going to be monitoring it much, much uh, more acutely. Uh, thus, if there's non-compliance in certain areas, you know, the risk to your company, not only in terms of uh, reputationally, but legally and operationally are going to be uh, much more uh, higher, not only from the threat actors in terms of trying to leverage uh, the opportunities and vulnerabilities within your system, but also from our own uh, government in terms of the consequences of non-compliance um, and, uh, allowing and facilitating it. And I'm, I'm in the private sector, so make no mistakes about it. In the private sector, I see a ton of people, you know, kind of going, hey, tick, 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 but it's superficial. And I think it's just a matter of time sometimes that the consequences are gonna go because of the evolution, the way the things are, are happening. And I think the other thing that's really uh, important is, is that, the interconnectivity between money laundering, which I talked about before, and even though government and regulatory bodies are looking at it as this linear activity and li linear threat, the threat actors themselves, you know, are, they don't look at it that way. They're, they're leveraging, they'll come knock on your front door on money laundering and they'll come knock on your window, you know, for corruption. And then they'll knock on your back door uh, for insider threat and cyber uh, uh, type of attacks. Mm -hmm. And they'll just look at, hey, how do we get into the system and exploit the vulnerabilities and uh, also to you know impact it negatively um, by attacking it through different vectors. And you know, that's I, I would say that's probably the biggest the biggest change out there, you know, in terms of uh, risk uh, right now. And a lot of people don't really understand, you know, that they're in this highly polarized conflictual setting that really changes the risk. All right, that was a really good answer. Um, now, the next question I've been wanting to ask you since we started our conversation about this, and I'm you know, kind of falling off my chair when to get the answer, but obviously I'm standing right now. But the point is, I want to learn more about your investigative background. You know, what lessons have you learned? And then my favorite question is, what cases can you share? Like, what were the lessons learned there? So, not to sound redundant, but if if I've learned anything, you know, probably starting in 2007, you know, when I was more in the intel versus the investigative world, I I had the uh, I had the luxury to kind of not get you know down rabbit holes in investigation and just focus at the evidence, but I was really able to look at what's all happening out there and understanding um, the activities, the threat actors, uh, how they operate, how they're structured, uh, what their strategies are, et cetera. And so what did I learn? Um, probably the critical importance in terms of identifying, mitigating, uh, and having some predictable 
uh, type of approach, inclusive of prevention uh, and being proactive. Uh, and that's applying the lens of a geopolitical risk lens uh, mm -hmm. to the activities of not only money laundering, but all these other uh, threats. And I think without that lens, it's hard to uh, predict. And everybody that I talk to, I say, do it. And mm -hmm. our former director of our national intelligence and security uh, service, equivalent to the US uh, CIA, made a statement a couple of years ago. And uh, his statement was, if you're not interested in geopolitics, geopolitics is interested in you. And it was in the context of a larger discussion on China. And um, really, when I, I was fascinated by the statement, um, and I took a look at it, and as I had some discussions with people and did a little research, I actually found that statement was from the uh, famous Russian philosopher uh, Trotsky. And the original oh. statement was, if you're not interested in war, war is interested in you. And I think he probably just softened it for the Canadian public that like soft messages. Yeah. Um, and really he was saying, pay attention. And he was talking to university professors, bankers, mm. lawyers, everybody. And I say the same people thing for AML professionals is if you're not interested in geopolitics, geopolitics is interested in you. So that would be the number one investigative uh, uh, issue or, or, or lesson. The other lesson that, that I learned from an investigative uh, uh, perspective, and one that I'm very frustrated at watching, you know, uh, what's happening in the world currently, particularly in the ML and AML world, mm -hmm. is their hyper focus in a very linear assessment in terms of um, uh, money laundering and the threat of money laundering. Mm -hmm. Money laundering is a <laughs> subset or secondary activity of about three or four other types of activities ranging from corruption, cyber, and you know, the list goes on. And, and states are uh, involved in it. They're, they're using some of these uh, activities, you know, for weaponization in terms of part of this larger uh, conflict. And if corporations and financial institutions are hopeful to mitigate that threat, and they wanna be proactive and predictive, they have to look at all these other threats um, and understand the current environment that they're operating in. And I think I see so often AML professionals uh, hold themselves out as, as experts, but unless you have a 360 perspective on, on what's happening around you in terms of securities, in, in terms of uh, risk, I don't know if you can be an expert in terms of risk unless you have a multi-dimensional perspective of risk. And I see so many people doing it. I was, I was over in Eastern Europe uh, working with a, uh, uh, a group of uh, professionals uh, that worked in a very high risk environment, you know, relative to uh, Russian threats and others. And I asked the head of security, I said, what, what, what's your security protocol? What's your risk mitigation? Well, we primarily focus on IT um, and that's it. And I said, well, in our profession, if you're just locking the front door and you're not looking at it holistically, we don't even call that security. We don't even call that risk management. It's just, it's like a locksmith. You're just a locksmith going to the door. Mm -hmm. And really, I question whether that's risk management. That's just like having a locksmith. And the, the, I, I wouldn't call a locksmith a security expert. And I wouldn't call a locksmith... Uh, a risk management expert. So unless you're kind of holistic and proactive uh, and looking at things, trying to be predictive, uh, that's probably the thing. The third thing that I learned probably was relative to governments are getting less and less and less tolerable in terms of risk. Um, and I think they have pro probably far better idea in terms of the non-compliance that people think they do. But I think they're just at this particular point it's a capacity issue to be able to respond and uh, do something about those particular risks uh, because they're overwhelmed with uh, some of the activity that's currently going on, you know, ranging from, you know, the, the infusion or the uh, rise of the cyber threats uh, to all the other international stuff. So a lot of the people in security and intelligence uh, world that are looking at these threats, I think they're collecting a lot of information on it.
Mm-hmm. And just because somebody hasn't come knocking on your door yet, um, I, I guess a cautionary note is um, be cautious because they may have awareness. It's just a matter of capacity issues because they're so overwhelmed and prioritizing some of these state actors. Oh, that's a good answer. And I love your experience with Russia. Um, that's pretty intriguing. So switching gears a little bit. Now, you know, I perform risk assessments during my years and it's more, it, it, you know, you you take the external perspective a little bit, but it's more about the internal risk. You know, why do you think risk assessments are so important these days? Well, I think they... I think there's a higher risk to corporations uh, and entities uh, for because of the, you know, again the. It, it's it's not it's not the guy selling the kilos of coke uh, anymore. It's state actors and people are taking it a lot more serious, in terms of uh, you know governments, um, the technology, uh, also in terms of what governments are using. Uh, is getting far greater because they're leveraging, you know, AI, <clears throat> machine learning, and other uh, capabilities to try to identify these threats because it's such a, it's kind of transitioned from a maybe a financial integrity threat, which sounds like, you know, you know, facetiously, you know, I, I'm, I'm just using it as a metaphor, paper cut to, hey, it's a national security issue and people's uh, entities, including, you know, the, um, Fortune 500 companies are under risk and threat, you know, in terms of c- competition from China, Russia, and others. <clears throat> Excuse me. So people are taking it a lot more uh, seriously, and that includes leveraging um, both corporate technology, uh, you know, that's out there in the private sector, but also government technology to try to identify and uh, mitigate it. And I and I just use Canada as a, an example. Um, and other uh, st- other entities, <clears throat> I think you know. In terms of like from the Five Eyes perspective and the NATO's perspectives, everybody's looking at the same threat actors, the same threats, and illicit finance is a big part of it all. And maybe before historically, you know, and I, I use Canada as an example. You know, maybe uh, maybe I'm sure there still is willful blindness on part of uh, governments. Um, to do it, but I think there's a greater uh, concern in terms of non-compliance and for governments to take action because they know their neighbors are all looking at each other going, are you doing your job? Are you doing your duty? Uh, And the tolerance amongst states uh, Mm -hmm. and governments and their uh, agencies is less to tolerate that type of activity not only because of the harm that it does, but because of the political implications for not addressing it. And I, and, and I highlight Canada's kind of got a great track record for mm. willful blindness, um, and probably still does. Mm. Um, and, and that's all due to the relationship between uh, the government, corporations, and foreign entities like China and others. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so my last question is, and you meant you alluded to some of this before about coaching clients, right? Yes. If you have like a top three list of tips you provide, or is there a Calvin Krusty cheat, cheat sheet available out there? Well, it's funny, right? Because when I looked at the questions before, um, I came up with just one, but, okay. but, but, but now you put me on the spot. Now you've added three to the, the question. So uh, n- n- number one, um, and we do this with our, our clients, not just in illicit finance, but in the broad range of threats and risk. And that's just having, we always encourage them to have an ongoing relationship with us mm-hmm. that uh, allows, that uh, that understands the threat environment perhaps more than, than they do because their focus is, you know, whatever production, you know, uh, making widgets or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, and then their security folks are looking at, you know, uh, access passes to the building and everything else. But with these rise of these new threats, I, I think it takes uh, a certain um, mindset and, and, a, and a, a group of individuals with, you know, multidimensional, multidisciplinary uh, 
thinking. So we encourage them to have a relationship with an entity such as us on a long term so that say, hey, once a month we have a weekly call with them and they pick up and go, hey, we saw something odd here. We saw something odd here. Can we have a conversation about it? And what we find happening quite often uh, during this uh, approach is all these things that were either ignored or hmm, just a, like a, a gut feeling. Right. So, Susan, as we start looking at them or having conversations about them, then they start seeing that there's more to it in most cases. So having a relationship with a third party, i.e. a third eye, um, you know, just having that critical analysis in terms of some of the stuff going on, helpful. Um, I'll probably get to two. The That's second awesome. one that, 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 that I, I use is stories and stories, you know, from a cultural historical perspective mm -hmm. are the most um, influential uh, ways to change behavior and thinking is through storytelling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we are fortunate in our group um, because we all have white hair, most of us, uh, <laughs> we have a lot of stories uh, to go with our, our, our backgrounds. And, and I think there's a lot of good stories out of there. And sadly, you know, the greatest lessons to be learned, uh, I always advocate is through failure, not successes. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people in business, you know, um, and in the corporate world, and, and in other worlds are self promoters, uh, where I rather kind of look at, you know, what the failures are, including my own in terms of missing things, et cetera, et cetera, and others, uh, organizations missing things. And I think those things uh, have the biggest impact. If you look at human behavior and decision making and strategic decision making, um, you know, a lot of people, salespeople selling products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, go, hey, here's the benefit of ABC. Uh, strategic decision making is, you know, shows that the most effective uh, way to change decisions, and I don't mind, mean by creating a, a fear culture, but a realistic, you know, consequence of uh, shortcomings by short, sharing stories that include, you know, other people's failures, my own failure, you know, and that helps particularly in terms of the humility attached to it. But I think storytelling is a, is a great way of looking at them. Yeah, I can, couldn't agree with you more about storytelling because you also, you think about the, the the mind of an individual, you know, their attention span, their retention. Stories usually hit home um, yeah. and linger. And you, you think about it going forward, especially if a case similar comes up. So, yeah, I, I totally agree on that one. Well, Calvin, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, we went through a lot of information, but your expertise and knowledge is second to none. So thank you for coming on and I hope you join me again. Thanks very much. Pleasure uh, having you. Finally, great to uh, do something in person. Uh, well, not person, but virtually rather than uh, email and phone calls. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Calvin. Thanks.